it's my, uh, my pleasure to reconvene this session on uh, excited state uh, uh, processes uh, and to uh, hand the floor over to Oleg Prezdo, uh, who will be talking, telling us about excited state dynamics and hybrid materials for solar energy harvesting. Um, and, um, uh, and so I'll hand it over to you, Oleg. Yeah, hi, Troy. Uh, can you hear me fine? I can hear you just fine, yes. Oh, good. Let me now share the screen. Um, go full screen mode and set up a pointer. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Johan for making this happen. And um, it's very nice to see everybody, at least virtually. Uh, I'm going to talk about our uh, quantum dynamics simulations on several materials. First, I'll spend a few slides on um, discussing what we do. Fortunately for me, uh, Antoine um, yesterday already introduced uh, a lot about surface hopping. What we do, we combine uh, surface hopping with real-time TDDFT. And then I'll give you a few examples uh, that involve organic matter. And I'll start with a singlet fission, which is probably as organic as we've done, but it's not so easy to do uh, double excited states with real-time TDDFT. And then I'll switch to hybrid materials where we have organic uh, polymers or molecules with the inorganic quantum dots or carbon nanotubes. And Troy, I think we'll have a full talk on this topic. And it's actually quite interesting what happens if you put organic and inorganic matter next to each other. For example, in um, molecules, you have singlet fission. In uh, quantum dots, you have multiple exons. What would you have if you try to do something like this when you have one molecule and one quantum dot? Um, then I'll uh, talk briefly about um, materials such as graphene, which have no gap, but people still are able to use uh, graphene as a light harvester and inject electrons into TaO2, for example. And similar question arises when you have plasmonic materials. Uh, how is this possible, even though electrons and holes should recombine very fast? And then I'll spend the last few minutes that I will have on metal halide perovskites. And um, in Russia, there's a joke that to prepare for an exam, you just need to uh, learn one topic. I could say, oh, organic uh, uh, hybrid perovskite is mostly inorganic material, but it has this little organic part, and therefore it fits into the conference. And I'll talk about it. But this is a joke. But the uh, serious statement is that actually metal halide perovskites, even though they have a uh, dominantly inorganic component, they behave almost more like organic matter uh, than uh, normal inorganic semiconductors. So what we do, we combine a real-time TDDFT with um, non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. Uh, so we have some kind of nuclear motion uh, that gives us time-dependent Hamiltonian. And time-dependent Hamiltonian uh, defines the DFT functional. And we solve uh, the time-dependent Concham equations uh, in which we include non-adiabatic coupling, which in allows us to consider transitions between electronic states. We also could include spin-orbit coupling, Coulomb coupling that couples quantum like states and so on. And uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, my interest was more into uh, semi-classical and quantum classical uh, approximations. So for example, we uh, tried to define a quantum classical Lie bracket that combines commutator and Poisson bracket. Then we wanted to couple quantum and classical dynamics uh, using Bohmian interpretation of quantum mechanics. Then we realized that it's important to capture some uh, nuclear quantum effects. Uh, such as zero point energy, and then the coherence was important. And more recently, we've uh, been doing uh, more practical developments. Uh, so we've implemented this in real time TGDFT. Uh, we've introduced this classical path approximation, which actually is quite useful for efficiency purposes. And the assumption here is that uh, fluctuations, thermal fluctuations, uh, dominate, and uh, they are more important than energy differences uh, or equilibrium geometry differences between different electronic states. Then we realized that uh, many particle transitions and super exchange. Exchange are not so easy to model with normal surface hopping, and we developed some methods like that. Uh, this year, we've uh, explicitly introduced Coulomb interactions to do OGA like processes. And now we're learning to do machine learning to be able to uh, run longer simulations. Uh, Alexey Akimov um, has developed this program, PicSide, and he continues to develop uh, this kind of methodology a lot with more advanced ways. There's a school that he's running uh, this month. If you're interested to know what we do, you should go to his website and uh, he has links and forums and things like that. Let me first start with uh, this uh, very organic problem that we 
try to study. We studied uh, semiconductor complex and multiple stars quite extens extensively. And when singlet fission came along, we wanted to do singlet fission as well. But it's not so easy to do this with DFT because you need double excited states. So we developed some more. But there were still some fundamental questions that uh, we could answer even with the model. So the question that was raised in this science paper was, um, what is the initial excitation? Is it mostly singly excited state or a combination of singly and, and double excited state? And uh, once you photo excite, what is the mechanism for single fission? In this paper, it was also a, a accompanied by charge transfer from, um, from this fantasy in crystal into C60. And uh, so we had to develop a model the energy levels we had to take from experiments from higher level calculations such as Paul Zimmerman's and so on. But what we concluded was the following. So first of all, is that um, if your initial state is only dominantly singly excited state, you're not gonna get much singlet fission. You're gonna have very fast electron transfer from this pentacene crystal into a C60. If your initial state has a large a fraction of uh, double excited state, that's much better. You're gonna proceed and singlet fission quite efficiently, but still at the same time, it's gonna compete with the charge transfer. And therefore, if you have mono layer of pentacene or even a few layers, it's not gonna give you the most efficient configuration. What's better if you have a pretty thick pentacene crystal such that uh, there's enough uh, time for the charges uh, to go the singlet fission process instead of being transferred. Uh, so this was the conclusion, but we did not pursue much uh, in, in this vein because uh, it was not so easy. But we've done quite a bit of hybrid materials. I'll give you a few examples. This was done by tight binding DFT, Shugara Paul, uh, who's now in India, uh, and he was uh, with Thomas Frauenheim, uh, implemented what we do with the DFTB plus. And uh, we look here at porphyrin molecule, that's on a carbon nanotube. And first thing you notice, if you look at the density of states, is that carbon nanotube has much higher density of states, and this creates a pretty substantial asymmetry uh, in the uh, dynamics. So you can photoexcite for solar energy, you can photoexcite molecule or carbon nanotube. And when you photoexcite the molecule, you have electron transfer, and it's much faster than when you photoexcite carbon nanotube and you have hole transfer. And there are two reasons for this. Uh, one reason is that you have much higher density of acceptor states for electron transfer, and even your initial state that you photo excite that's on the molecule has a substantial tail into the carbon nanotube. And the second reason is that you have much higher frequency motions involved, which create faster avoided crossings, uh, faster crossings of the initial and final energy levels, and that helps. Uh, sorry. What we discovered uh, just this year was something interesting actually, uh, and surprising. So what we've done, we've introduced defects into the carbon nanotube. Uh, in this case, it's an extra C2 dimer that creates a 7575 uh, defect. But you can also rotate a C2 bond, and it also gives you a 7575 defect. And in both cases, we saw faster charge separation and slower change recombination, which is good. Usually, people try to avoid defe defects, but what we saw in the simulation is that consistently, the uh, it was both ways it was better. Ch separation was faster, and recombination was slower. Uh, and there's a simple reason for this, uh, which is the work function of carbon nanotube. When you introduce defects, it creates new uh, electrostatic potential because it breaks the uh, neutrality of all the atoms. And the work function of CNT uh, becomes larger. So the energy level of CNT drops relative to the energy level of your molecule. So therefore, the gap for your uh, charge separation from the molecule into uh, the CNT, from the CNT into the molecule. Uh, is uh, decreasing, which accelerates separation. And the gap from the molecule to the CNT is increasing, which slows down the combination. Um, so we also looked at uh, polymers uh, versus carbon nanotubes. In both cases, we are, uh, we're dealing with 1D materials. And there are lots of uh, discussion about the similarities of the properties of CNTs and conjugated polymers. But if you put them side by side, they actually are quite different. Uh, if you look at the density of states, there's a huge asymmetry. You have a much larger dose for carbon nanotubes versus uh, um, polymer. And because of this, you have much faster injection of charge from polymer to carbon nanotube uh, than from carbon nanotube to the polymer. And this kind of scheme, uh, um, this kind of conclusion uh, shows up in, in most calculations. Uh, formally speaking, maybe these are both 1D materials, but they're quite different materials. And from the practical point of view, 
uh, you can uh, put more uh, polymer, for example, in your material, and then you're going to have much faster charge transfer, charge separation. But then you're going to lose more energy into heat because you're losing quite a bit of energy uh, to split the exton and to transfer charge down in energy. But if you put more CNT, then you have much less exton binding energy is not so strong, and you can get away with the smaller charge losses. But uh, but then your separation your separation is not as efficient. And, uh, finally, uh, in the serious examples uh, of examples, if we put uh, this polymer, same polymer on the quantum dot, which is zero dimensional. Uh, well, uh, polymer is one dimensional, but locally they behave almost the opposite. Locally, your quantum dot is basically almost like a piece of bulk. It's almost a bulk material. It has much higher density of states. And your polymer, the part of the polymer that interacts with the quantum dot is almost like a small molecule. Uh, and therefore, the behavior is just like that. You have uh, Faster electron transfer, slower hole transfer. So faster transfer from molecule to quantum dot, slower from quantum dot to molecule. And what's also interesting now is that because quantum dots are made of heavy elements, uh, if we look at uh, as the polymer or polymer with quantum dot, charge recombination is much, much faster than if you just have the uh, quantum dot by itself because you have much lighter atoms and much faster motions uh, in the molecule than in the quantum dot. Um, but this work goes back uh, to uh, about 10 years ago uh, when he just started at Fiskem Letters and uh, Prashant Kamat, he was the, uh, he started the journal. Uh, I was looking at his uh, experiments quite a lot and I found this experiment, uh, first he combined uh, C60 with the quantum dot as a mechanical mixture and he saw charge separation on some nanos nanosecond time scale. And then a few years later, he did the same kind of experiment where he connected the quantum dot C60 by some bridge, but this bridge was not conjugated. It was just some molecule that created a connection. And of course, in experiment, uh, this mechanical mixture is more complicated, but in our calculation, it was, uh, they were touching. So the distance is much smaller. It was direct contact between donor and acceptor. But in this case, there was a bridge that separated uh, electron donor and acceptor, and this was an insulating bridge. And what was interesting that in our calculations as well, we had faster transfer when we had this bridge that was insulating, separated donor acceptor by a larger distance. And it turns out what happens is that it's not the donor acceptor coupling that matters, but it's the electron quantum coupling. Because when you go from the quantum dot uh, to C60, you have to drop quite a bit of energy. And when you only have the quantum dot, uh, it has very slow uh, motions, very heavy element, cadmium, selenium. And this process is not as efficient than if you have a bridge. So what bridge does, why it makes it faster, it does not make the coupling larger, it actually makes it smaller, the donor acceptor coupling, but it increases electron quantum coupling. And that's why you can dump more energy more efficiently and that accelerates the charge separation. Um, another example, when you have a molecule on, on, um, on a quantum dot, so this was modeling a Tim Lian experiments. And uh, in those days, we worried a lot about defects in quantum dots. Usually defects in quantum dots are considered to be bad. Like uh, I discussed, defects in carbon nanotubes, usually people would like to avoid those defects. But in fact, for charge separations, they're not bad, they're good. So, what we've done here, we modeled uh, uh, Tim Dan's experiments for electron transfer from uh, quantum dot to the molecule and then recombination. And we could uh, reproduce the, um, so this is experiment, this is theory, we could reproduce the backward transfer, the recombination pretty well. But the separation was uh, too slow in our calculation in order of magnitude too slow. And then when we introduced the defect state, it actually made much better agreement with experiment. Uh, why? Because first of all, now you have you don't have to cross across a large gap. You can do this step by step. And then defect state localizes into the molecule because the molecule wants to bind where the defect is and the uh, electronic coupling is stronger as well. Um, so let me now discuss uh, a little bit about the OGA processes. Quantum dots and, and other nanoscale materials uh, have a quite unusual uh, intermediate situation in which you have still strong uh, electron hole interactions. Uh, this is what causes singlet fission, for example, in molecular crystals. But you also have high densities of states. Uh, while in bulk semiconductors, you have high densities of states, but you don't have strong electron hole uh, interactions because electrons and holes can be separated. So what can happen in nanoscale materials is this kind of process, OJ process, which is very common in all, all those materials, where uh, the electron can give energy to hole. And this process, uh, in this example, fills the so-called phonon bottleneck because 
uh, there were lots of attempts uh, to observe slow relaxation of electron from, from this uh, LUMO plus one into LUMO, but it never happened because you have this hole that can be uh, accepting the energy. And here we just showed that when you have a molecule on the carbon on, on the quantum dot, you can trap the hole, yes, but hole trapping is too slow. So this energy exchange or the like energy exchange between electron and hole can happen before the uh, hole is trapped. And that's why this strategy is not very efficient. But what is really interesting is that this new mechanism of electron transfer that can happen in nanoscale materials. This is again molecule on, on a quantum dot, uh, work from Kim Lian where he made lots of molecules, lots of quantum dots, all these points. And he was looking for the Marcus inverted regime, uh, right? Because that's what made uh, Marcus famous and uh, got, got him the Nobel Prize. Uh, the surprising fact that when you lower your uh, accept energy too much, you, you cross on the other side and you have uh, your, your reaction rate drops again. And instead of this turnover, what um, him and his students saw was this saturation. Uh, which uh, needed an explanation, and that's what we've done. And this is again this kind of OJ process that I've uh, already discussed. Uh, when you have a simple model, you forget if you have a uh, molecular thinking, basically, you have initial state, final state, and then you don't really worry about all these uh, states that your hole can have. But what happens in the in the uh, in this case? When the energy of the electron drops, instead of giving this energy to formants, which would give you inverted Marcus regime, the energy goes into the hole. This happens only transiently. So this red line, which is the energy of the hole, it rises and then it drops. So after three picoseconds, you don't even know that your hole was uh, excited at all because there is a very dense manifold of states and the hole relaxes uh, by formants. But it totally changes the inverted regime behavior. So if you have no uh, OGA process, you have this inverted behavior. If you have OGA process, you have saturation. Um, then we've looked at a few systems where you have um, things like graph key that have no gap. And then you have electron acceptor TO2 in this case. And people uh, would excite graphene and would still observe a charge separation. And this is very similar to what people have in plasmonics in the sense that uh, your uh, donor has no energy gap, it's a, it's a metal. Uh, how is it possible that you photo excite a metal and the charge goes in? Uh, so in case of graphene, what we saw, first of all, is that when you heat this up, you see some kind of chemistry going on. Uh, so you have, uh, so in this case, we have four and eight member rings, which is likely artifact of the simulation cell. But in experiment, uh, I'm pretty sure what they see are parts of the system that are graphene oxide. So the oxygen of TO2 uh, interacts chemically very strong, strongly with graphene. What happens is that you, uh, create very strong donor acceptor coupling. And even though graphene has no gap by itself, uh, it would uh, facilitate very fast electron hole recombination. When you have this very strong coupling, you either inject very fast or you can even uh, create uh, an excitation. Like in this example, there are different types of excitations you can have in graphene. But in this example, your four excited state already has a large density that's in the acceptor. And in all simulations that we've done, the initial conditions, your, uh, the energy relaxation was slower than charge, uh, uh, charge injection. E1, E2, E3, in all cases, injection was faster than relaxation. And that, that explained why you can have efficient charge separation, even though graphene has no gap. Uh, so and then we moved on to look at metallic particles uh, with the same question, how come you can have a piece of metal? And in experiment, this is a big particle. It really has no energy gap and you still inject when you excite a plasma. And traditional mechanism said that you have excitation that creates this collective excitation of electrons that dephases fast into electrons and holes, and then the electron can inject. But again, why electrons and holes don't recombine? And we did calculations in which we took this small representation of the metallic particle, and we saw a tail. And in this paper, 2014, we said, oh yes, uh, there's a chance, substantial, maybe 20%, that your photo excited uh, electron is already inside TO2 right away. And then what's interesting is that uh, one year later, 2015, Tim Lian again, he published this science paper in which he uh, argues the same mechanism. What he measures here is the yield, which is the efficiency of electron injection versus the energy of your photo excited electron. And uh, if you follow the traditional mechanism, what you see is that um, you create this electron hole pairs uh, distributed randomly with respect to the Fermi energy. And uh, therefore, uh, in order for the electron to be above the conduction band H, 
it's better to excite at high energy. So the higher the total energy, the more likely your electron is going to be high to inject. And that's why traditional models give you this uh, dependence on the pump energy, on energy. But in experiments, Tim Leon did not see this, and uh, he saw no dependence on the energy down to some threshold. And this threshold was exactly the gap from the Fermi energy, the conduction band H. And this is exactly what we uh, almost, even the picture is almost the same. We have this uh, tail that extends into the acceptor. But this only happens uh, efficiently when you have 3D material. When we put the same pyramid on 2D material, which is chemically heavy, we see much less of this tail. And if we don't put a pyramid, but some uh, kind of cylinder, for example, rod, uh, this tail is much smaller even. So this uh, photo extension of charge transfer state is efficient when you have a system that has strong chemical attraction. So in the experiment, by the way, Leon grew gold particles on cadmium selenide rods. Um, yeah, so this is recent where we, uh, plasmonics, we keep doing plasmonics now, where we uh, um, looked uh, at a uh, long time MD trajectory based on a machine learning force field. And then we identified some interesting events in which this atom can be away from the from its normal uh, equilibrium location. And then when it's, when it's away, the lifetime of a particular state that's very close to the edge of the conduction band of MOS2 is long lived or three times, two times longer lived. And this may help uh, explain why uh, you see plasmonic uh, effects that are more than just heating uh, given by the plasma energy. And uh, let's see how much time I have left. Maybe five minutes. Um, so perovskites, uh, it's a topic that uh, you can talk and talk and talk about. Uh, but it's actually quite interesting things that you can uh, discuss. It's not only because they're efficient and so on, but they have properties that are not just of inorganic semiconductor, but also of organic species and even liquid. Uh, so what, what happens, you have this inorganic lattice. So this is superposition of many snapshots from MD. Uh, and uh, green is iodine and red is uh, lead. And this uh, molecule in the middle, it's MA, uh, which rotates. So it has inorganic lattice that supports charge conductivity. So they conduct much better than organic systems, as far as I know. Uh, but at the same time, you have this organic part. Uh, it behaves almost like a liquid uh, in terms of solvation. And, and these days, people draw analogies between the weighted electrons or wet electrons and what happens in, with the chlorons and protoskites. Um, so what I'm showing you here, why it's important, because if you have a liquid, you cannot have a defect. So there's always a question, how come uh, perovskites are um, not, um, don't, 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 defects in perovskites are benign. If you have a liquid, you cannot have a defect because the liquid fills the defect. So if you have something that can move, adjust, and it's not just actually the molecules, the whole lattice can adjust, your uh, it can heal defect. What we see, I'm going to talk about just two defects, iodine, extra iodine interstitial and iodine vacancy. In the case of interstitial, we have extra iodine that creates uh, a mid-gap state that's close to the valence band. Uh, this is the charge density of this state. And what's interesting is that it's very localized, and especially it's important that it does not overlap with the charge density of the free electron in the conduction band. So what happens is that the hole is trapped, but then the recombination of the trapped hole with the free electron is so slow, the hole can go away and be trapped. When you have traditional semiconductor, the hole is trapped, it's, it, rec it recombines with the electron, never goes away back uh, to the uh, valence band. And in this case, it can go back to the valence band and um, the charges uh, can still flow. So this is very good. Uh, now it's a vacancy. So vacancy by itself uh, creates no mid-gap state, which is good. But if you send currents, if you run this in some solar, under solar sunlight, you, you start, you can oxidize the seconds. You, you're ch sending charges. And this is now totally like organic system because when you take an uh, inorganic semiconductor, cadmium selenide, you can put multiple charges there. The structure is not going to change. Its state energies, you can have gap renormalized maybe by a fraction, maybe by 10, 10 milliEV or so, but not, not much changes. But in this case, you have this um, lattice, which is quite soft, and there's organic matter inside. Uh, but actually, it doesn't even matter that you have organic matter inside. It's just that the lab is very soft. But the structure changes. So when you put one extra charge, when you oxidize this once, you create a mid-gap state already. But when you oxidize it twice, not only you create mid-gap state, another one, yet you create a new chemical species, PB, PB dimer. And that's where this shallow trap state uh, arises from. And, um, and we have very strong dependence of carrier lifetime on oxidation state. 
Uh, so you do photochemistry, even though this is formally inorganic material. If you have a long lifetime initially, it can decrease by a factor of almost two orders of magnitude uh, if you oxidize. Uh, another interesting uh, phenomenon, you have uh, opposite temperature dependence of carrier lifetime. Normally, if you freeze, I should be stopping, yeah? If you freeze, uh, if you freeze uh, your system, it never decays to the ground state. So the colder the temperature, uh, the slower it decays. But this is not the case with, uh, uh, with this material. Uh, if you increase the temperature, the lifetime goes up. Why? Especially it's strange if you look at the non adiabatic coupling because it has explicitly velocity in this and the higher the temperature, the faster the velocity. But is this overlap that matters? And what happens, you create some disorder. Again, I think lots of analogy with the organic matter. Uh, in temperature, when you raise temperature, you create disorder. But in this case, disorder is moderate, it's not very large. So conductivity is still okay, but the overlap of electron and hole wave functions now decreases because they are now localized partially. And this metric element goes down, so the non adiabatic coupling goes down, and uh, the whole system lives longer I think I should uh, yeah, not uh, talk too much. I just want to say, for example, when people talk about shallow traps, deep traps, and trough skites, uh, and they base this on uh, on, ground state, on on zero temperature calculations, you cannot make, draw a conclusion because at, uh, you have a very large fluctuation of the trap state energy. Again, this is like organic matter because inorganic materials would not show this normal cadmium talonite, for example. And lots of unharmonicity in this mode, in this system as well. You cannot assume the system is harmonic and compute electron form coupling based on harmon harmonic approximation because you raise temperature, you go into more harmonic regime, and more and more phonon modes contribute because uh, of uh, you break uh, the strict selection rules of harmonic systems. So I'm going to stop. We developed this pretty unique uh, methodology that allows us to study many kinds of materials, and I talked about single division composites of molecules with the quantum dot CNTs. This direct photo excitation when you have metallic system and uh, metal halide trophies. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Oleg. I'll give you a special round of applause on behalf of everyone. Um, and uh, I'll invite folks to put questions into the chat. I actually had one question for you, Oleg, just out of the last part of your talk. Um, where you were talking about the perovskite materials. I know that one of the challenges in simulating the perovskite materials with DFT can be the spin orbit coupling effects uh, in that it sort of dr fairly dramatic, can fairly dramatically change the band structure because uh, they're sort of spin orbit bands. Do you, do you see any, um, any effects from that in terms of sort of, you know, renormalization of the band gap or, or, or things along those lines? Right, so first of all, uh, yeah, it has lead and it has huge spin orbit coupling. Luckily, uh, when you have spin orbit coupling, it decreases the gap. So if your PBE uh, already underestimates the gap, if you do calculation with the hybrid functional and add spin orbit coupling, you get the same gap for this uh, lead-based perovskite. Of course, you need to check what the energy levels of defects are. And we it's expensive for us to do uh, PBE zero, let's say, and uh, uh, spin orbit for MD, for NAMD, but uh, we check uh, always in the optimized geometry where these defect levels are. Uh, now we study non-lead based perovskites and it's more complicated because uh, spin orbit coupling is not so strong. And then uh, PBE uh, underestimates the gap, but HSC, let's say with the spin orbit actually overestimates the gap. Yeah, another important thing is that uh, you have splitting, especially the conduction band uh, splits into two bands if you have spin orbit coupling. Sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. So if we only focus, for example, um, some kind of bottleneck in the hot electron relaxation inside the conduction band, we don't really care about the gap to the valence band. We just do PBE with spin orbit coupling and we get the splitting and that's how we do it. But yeah, but it's a good question, absolutely. Yeah. And then Wei Tao asks if you can compare your method with surface hopping. Right, so what we do is some kind of surface hopping. The main approximation we make is that we assume that thermal fluctuations are much larger than uh, changes in geometry. For example, in perovskite, you have this organic molecule that rotates, and this inorganic lattice fluctuates a lot. What you can see is formation of polaron, which we can do actually by ground state DFT. Uh, exciton binding energy is not so strong. So sometimes, so there was a picture here where we made an exciton where we introduced two polarons separately and then combined and we rotated these atoms, uh, uh, the organic molecule separately. 
Yeah, so what we do is surface swapping, but we do using classical path approximation in 90% of the cases. Uh, so we still do either FSSH or our own methods for hop because uh, you need to reach Boltzmann equilibrium, for example, which uh, just propagating the time dependent consham equations cannot do. So you cannot lose energy to heat, for example. Uh, so it's an adapted version of surface hopping adapted for nanoscale materials. All right, well, thank you, Oleg. Uh, I'll give you again a virtual applause and um, you